now on Patreon. Good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well. My name is Rob Maynard, and today we're going to be reviewing the Fuji or Fujika GW690 Mark II. We're going to talk a little bit about the pros. We're going to talk a little bit about the cons and uh, why I think Fuji should come out with a modern day version of this camera for 2022. Hot take, right? Wow. Oh, my God. Somebody's talking about modern day film cameras. Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? I just want to be alone with all my memories. I don't even want a phone to read and bother me. Let me pop the strap off here. Because Groban likes his ladies to pop, this is the GW690 Mark II, and it is massive. It covers my entire head. It's massive. It's so big. Uh, it's also pretty heavy. Um, and most of it being made of plastic with a metal chassis, you wouldn't really expect it to be super, super heavy. Um, but obviously, it's just gigantic. Uh, also, I'm going to avoid calling this the Texas Leica. I absolutely despise hearing that. I think that is the stupidest thing. It's the size of Texas and it looks like it's a rangefinder. So it's the Texas Lyca. Like, shut up. Shut up. Yeah, so like I said, first impressions, it's obviously huge. Um, and it's made of plastic. One of the things that I think I wasn't really prepared for was sort of how cheap it felt and how cheap it sounded. It made me do one of those faces. It just sounds super cheap. It's a little off-putting uh, for a camera that would probably run you about eight to $900 in 2021. Um, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little off-putting. For those who don't know, rangefinder cameras don't allow you to focus and compose through the lens like traditional SLRs, but rather through the glass square known here as the rangefinder. Yeah, that's the rangefinder right there. This one is not super bright and it's it's lacking contrast. And while I was down by the river shooting, the sun started to come out and uh, I put my eyes to the rangefinder and uh, the image kind of looked boring, even though to my, my naked eye, the scene looked absolutely stunning. And that's due in large part to, to just how dull the rangefinder is. It is sort of this bluish tint. Um, it was pretty easy to find focus with it, but it is dull. And I think that kind of goes a long way in maybe deterring people from uh, from taking the shot when you put your eye up to the camera and, and you want to compose. And what you see through the, the rangefinder is not what you see with your eye. It, it, it's, it can be a little bit distracting. Uh, and might deter you from taking a shot because it certainly did for me. So some of you may be wondering why I decided to switch from a nice colorful vibrant film like Kodak Ektar 100 to Ilford Delta 400. Uh, it's because I need a little bit more flexibility with hand holding. I'm going to be underexposing this film shooting at ISO 800 and pushing my development a full stop to, uh, to pull some of that back. But essentially what happens when you push your film is uh, we're going to introduce a little bit more grain to the image and we're also going to introduce a little bit more contrast, which I think is going to lend itself very nicely to this scene. There's some fog up on top of these naked trees and then you get some deep shadows obviously by the river and all the brush alongside of it. So I think a little bit of extra contrast really gonna make this scene pop. But you only can make eight images per roll, which is a bit of a downside. And uh, I found myself just absolutely burning through rolls of film with this camera. 
but that says something about it. It's obviously a whole lot of fun to shoot, which I'll get into later. I think I've done enough talking, at least for a little bit. We're going to break off into this abandoned house, and you guys can enjoy the sights and sounds of this abandoned home. How was that little break? Nice to not hear me for a couple of minutes, I bet. But I've been walking around this house for a little bit, almost an hour and a half, and uh, some of the really simple things started to stand out to me, like uh, this old wallpaper and the textures from the peeling paint. They all just really had this beautiful, simplistic look to me. And uh, the only issue was that the bright early morning sunlight that, that was started when I got here was starting to burn off. Unfortunately, it started to leave some of these images feeling kind of cold and empty, but maybe that's the point. It's an abandoned house. You know, it's it's been left, it's been forgotten, and that's part of its story. And I think uh, the way that this, this camera and the lens started to render those tones a little bit softer and a little bit more desaturated, uh, I think you know, it kind of just feels cold and empty. Let's talk about one of the things that I really don't like about this camera, and that is where the shutter and the aperture ring are located. Um, it's kind of disorienting. I can't tell you how many times when I was trying to change my shutter speed or change my aperture that I was accidentally changing the other. And obviously that comes with time. You'll understand the difference in feel of, of which one that you're trying to change. But for somebody like me, who's only been using it for the last two weeks, it's kind of disorienting. And because they are literally touching each other, it becomes really hard to differentiate the two. Even when I was just trying to change the aperture or the shutter speed, I was accidentally changing the focus too. And I think that's another part of it was everything is done on the lens. And I kind of like that in a sense. And like I said, it would take some time to get used to, but I think for me, just starting out with it, it was a really big frustration point. And I think for people that are gonna start using it, you might feel the same way. 
For me, I really didn't find it to be a huge issue because I was shooting on a tripod for most of the time. If you can slow it down a little bit and really be methodical about your shots and what you're doing, it's not that big of a deal really. But, um, but if you are a street photographer, that may introduce an interesting caveat to that because you know, trying to quickly change shutter speed while changing aperture and, and trying to hit focus really, really quickly in the scene, it, it may be pretty difficult. But it also begs the question, why would you be shooting this massive camera out on the street? It's just, it's huge. It doesn't really kind of flow with many street photographer style. But that's a great question, Robbie. I'm gonna answer that right now. Darling, I cry. Darling, I cry. So it turns out it's really not that cumbersome. Let's talk about the leaf shutter in this camera or more specifically in this lens. This allows shooters to take extremely quiet images and most importantly, vibration free images. SLRs are typically kind of loud because they have uh, a mirror that slaps up and down with the actuation of the shutter. Most notoriously and most obnoxiously on the Pentax 6.7, it is incredibly loud. I mean, you could, you could wake up a person out of sleep with that camera. But with this camera, it's a pin drop compared to that because it's a tiny little shutter that just opens and closes. There's no mirror or uh, any sort of boxed mechanism or anything like that. It's, it's very, very simple. It's very, very basic. It's very, very effective. This means that you can shoot handheld down to 1 15th of a second, which is what I did for one of these images, but I wanted to try out something a little bit more extreme, something I've never done before. Shoot handheld at one eighth of a second. Pretty crazy, pretty, oh, I'm a crazy guy, I don't know what to tell you. Listen, it didn't work out that well, this image here of the back end of Maury's Delicatessen. It, it's really out of focus, it's blurry. Well, it's not out of focus, it's just blurry. It's not, it's not great. So obviously one eighth of a second is just a little bit too slow of a shutter speed to be using handheld. So I decided to shoot at 1 15th of a shutter speed, which I thought was maybe a little bit more manageable, and it is, I shot uh, the Mount Tom Paper Company, the last building there that's currently coming down, I decided to shoot that at 1 15th of a second uh, at F11 and pretty darn sharp, no blur, no nothing. So 1 15th handheld worked out pretty well for me and keep in mind, I had about oh, this much Red Bull. I had a lot of Red Bull. Lots of Red Bull. But before I get roasted, yes, most cameras have mirror lockup buttons and yes, you probably have a steadier hand than I do, but you know what this camera does better than your 15 pound RB67? It makes huge ass negatives. And this is the reason why people love the Fuji. GW690. The stunning image quality and depth of field only reminiscent really of large format in my opinion. I was just blown away by how sharp this lens is from f3.5 all the way down to f11. It's just out of this world sharp in every possible and imaginable way. But two areas where I think this lens started to just fall apart a little bit uh, is in its vignetting and it's color rendition. And those are two big ones for me. So uh, let me kind of clarify that. Take for example, this image here, uh, the vignette is very, very noticeable. It's pretty strong. I shot this at F 5.6. Um, and I noticed that almost at every single aperture, there is a very, very noticeable vignette. And um, I don't know, there just wasn't a way to avoid that. What I did find though, other than how kind of bad the vignetting was with this lens. I shot mainly with my favorite film, Kodak Ektar 100, and I started to notice that the, the, the tones started to lean more towards the blues and the greens, and it really just wasn't popping. It didn't have that classic Ektar feel that I absolutely love and adore. Um, and I thought maybe there's something off with the development, and I re-upped my chemistry. Everything came out almost looking the exact same, kind of dull and, and sort of neutral, didn't have that pop that Ektar is known for. And uh, then I realized that you can see some of the paper backing on one of the shots. And I was like, oh, it's expired. It must be expired. And I checked the box and it's not expired. Uh, perhaps I just have a bad batch of Ektar 100. So I don't really want to just put this all on the Fuji lens, but I will say this, put an asterisk next to it. You might get some weird tones.
Honestly, I really had fun with this camera and I want to say a huge thank you to Matthew Morse, who is a subscriber and uh, who decided to loan me this incredible camera. You know, I think it's really hard to, to review a camera because there's one thing that you can't really describe and that is the intangibles, how it, how it makes you feel when you're out shooting, uh, the confidence it gives you and how fun it is. It's hard to put those things into words. And uh, this camera is just outright fun to use. I've been looking forward to shooting it every single day. Uh, I wake up every morning and I, I get my gear ready and I'm out the door and I'm just like, what can I possibly take a picture of? And I don't care how dumb, how small, how insignificant a scene or an image may, may be or perceived in my head. I just can't wait to see how, how big it's going to look on a six by nine negative. And honestly, it doesn't disappoint it is a super fun camera to use and an absolute joy to shoot with. Quick tip though, I would suggest that you buy a UV filter, screw it onto your lens, take the lens cap and throw it in the trash because there are so many times that I've forgotten in the past and while shooting with this camera that the lens cap was on and uh, gotten a couple blank frames. That one hurts when you only get eight. I took a shot with the the stupid lens cap on. Last but not least though, this is my plea to Fuji. Fuji, if you're watching, hear this cry. Please make a brand new film camera, six by nine, literally make this exact camera, but with a modern day lens and also make it with interchangeable lenses. Oh my God, I would love to see a, a six by nine, obviously they already have one with a, a wider lens, but the ability to interchange lenses would set this camera apart from, well, the competition, but there isn't any. That's where Fuji can capitalize. There's absolutely zero competition in the modern day film market. Get out there, you guys are still making great cameras. You have modern day lenses that are absolutely incredible. Get out there and make a brand new film camera. But for the consumers like myself, keep in mind that when this camera first came out, I don't know why I'm pointing to it, you guys can't see it. When it first came out, it was going for about $3,000 uh, in the US. Uh, so you have to ask yourself as a consumer, would you purchase a brand new modern day film camera with all those bells and whistles for over $3,000? I would, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Don't forget to check out my Patreon, which I have linked in the description below. And stay tuned for some bloopers because um, I'm a little wired from all the coffee. So there were a lot. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Mullet's coming back. I just did the entire thing. Where's my notes? Just did the entire thing without realizing that I was uh, not recording on my H5. <laughs> Good morning. All right. Again, thumbs up. I don't know why I keep doing that. <laughs> that is how I sync up my cameras after I have to turn off this camera and I leave the H5 recording. That's how I how I sync it up. <laughs> That's how I know. I can cut it right there and I can synchronize it in post. Pretty simple. That is going to be so annoying to so many people. Uh, I went over and shot the other side of Melly, Melly's delicatessen. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Matt, thank you. I'm, I'm never giving it back. <laughs>